Suzy. Suzy Snoop. And you're watching Snips and Snaps. Join me as I spy on people using English. Whoops. Hey, did you see my spin just now? Yeah. Yeah, it was so cool, wasn't it? You know what, again, you skateboard. I mean, mine's getting old and I need yeah, to skateboard yeah, you, the lion. You, you get one from the I need a drink. Yeah, me too. I think I'll have the iced coffee. And me, an iced tea. Yes, a really cold iced tea. One iced coffee and one iced tea, please, Pachi. Okay, coming right up. Great guy. <laughs> what are they building over there? Oh, they're building a new house. Oh. Anyway, so, what do you want to eat? I recommend Pat Din's nasi lemak. It's really delicious. Okay, if you say so. Pat Din, two plates of nasi lemak, please. Okay, coming right up. Oh, who's there when you need him? <laughs> oh, yeah. By the way, it's my treat. That's great. Thanks. Here you are. Here you are. Bon appetit. Thank you. <laughs> what was that all about? Wait. This is a coffee stop, right? I don't know. But one thing's for sure. This is going to cost us. I mean, you, a fortune. Huh. <laughs> nice little mug. <laughs> I don't think Ryan would ever eat at Pat Din's again. Well, here's my Snoop report. Let's start with what Ryan said. Anyway, so, what do you want to eat? When Ryan said, so, what do you want to eat? He was actually asking Ibrahim a question. In other words, he was inquiring. He wanted to know what Ibrahim felt like eating. You see, we inquire when we want to ask someone for information or to find out something. Let's see that again. So, what do you want to eat? So, the form that Ryan used was the sentence, So, what do you want to eat? And Ryan's function was to inquire or to ask. Remember what Ryan said when Ibrahim recommended the delicious nasi lemak? So, what do you want to eat? I recommend Pak Din's nasi lemak. It's really delicious. Okay, if you say so. What was Ryan doing? How did he respond to what Ibrahim said? That's right. He agreed. When we agree, we say yes to an idea, a plan or a suggestion. Let's see that one again. So, what do you want to eat? I recommend Pak Din's nasi lemak. It's really delicious. Okay, if you say so. So Ryan used the form, okay, if you say so, to perform the function of agreeing. What he did was to agree. Alright, where in the conversation did Ryan inform Ibrahim about something? Well, if you can't remember, watch this. Oh, oh yeah, by the way, it's my treat. That's great, thanks. Here, we see Ryan being really nice to Ibrahim. He informed Ibrahim that he, Ryan, was going to pay for the meal. When we inform, we give information to someone about something. Let's see how Ryan did that again. Oh, oh yeah, by the way, it's my treat. That's great, thanks. The sentence, oh, by the way, it's my treat, was the form that Ryan used to tell Ibrahim that he wanted to pay for the meal. In other words, he used it to inform Ibrahim. And how did Ibrahim react when he was informed about the treat? What did he say? Oh, oh yeah, by the way, it's my treat. That's great, thanks. Oh, yes, Ibrahim was very happy. He thanked Ryan. When we thank someone, we tell someone that we are grateful for something they have done. 
Ibrahim was thankful for the treat. Let's see that again. Oh, oh yeah, by the way, it's my treat. That's great, thanks. The form, that's great, thanks, was used by Ibrahim to thank Ryan. And the function? Yes, that's right, to say thank you. End of Snoop Report. See you in a bit. Maybe, because it's a building material. So he built it with clay and... Hmm... Uh, who's going to build what with clay and whatever else? Oh, hi. Sorry, boys, I spoke to you. I'm Susie. Oh, hi, Susie. Hi, I'm Isaac. Really, I'm and I are trying to understand a poem that we're reading. There are some words in it that we've never ever heard of. We're trying to figure out what waddles are. Because the poet says, I will arise and go now, and go to Innisfree, and a small cabin built there, of clay and wattles made. Sorry, I got carried away. Wattles? Oh, wattles. Wattle and dog. Wattles are little pieces of stick tied together on a frame of rods. Long ago, people used to cover wattles with mud or clay to build walls for houses. Oh! I know that poem. It's Lake... something or other, right? Yes! Yeah. The Lake Isle of Innisfree by William Butler Yeats. Hey, wait a minute. That's my name too. William. Maybe I'll be a great poet someday. <laughs> yeah, right. More like in uh, about 200 years. Oh, Isaac. Yeah, you're right, William. Maybe you will. But for now, let's work on the Lake Isle of Ministry. I'll get my friend Mrs. B to help us. Oh, Mrs. B! Hi, I'm Mrs. B, and welcome to the Literature Room. Today, I'm going to talk about a poem entitled The Lake Isle of Innisfree. Now, this poem was written about 100 years ago by an Irish man called William Butler Yeats. Now, let's look at the setting of this poem. This place called Innisfree is very close to nature. It's an idyllic place and the poet wants to build a cabin there and live among the birds and the bees. He hears the birds singing and the bees buzzing and he wants to grow his own vegetables and eat the honey produced by these bees. In fact, life is so peaceful and tranquil in Innisfree, especially when he can also hear the waves lapping in the lake of Innisfree. Now, let's take a look at this before we continue with the poem. I will arise and go now, and go to Innes Free. And a small cabin built there, of clay and wattles made. Now 
tiny bean rose will I have there? A hive for the honey bee. And live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer. Glow. An evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day. I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. version of the poem The Lake Isle of Innisfree. There are several aspects of the poem that we will have to learn to understand it better. Let's look at the metaphors that the poet William Butler Yeats uses. The first metaphor that describes the setting also describes the kind of feeling that overcomes him when he sees it. In the first stanza, Eads talks about the mist which envelops him in calmness and in tranquility. And he compares this mist to a veil. The second metaphor talks about the dimly lit sky filled with twinkling, glimmering stars. And in the third metaphor, he compares the afternoon sun with the purplish glows of the natural colors of nature. With all this, peace itself descends and the place is calm and tranquil. Now the metaphors themselves help the poem, but what about the mood and the tone? The mood is one of peace and calmness where one is in a meditative solitude feeling good even though one is lonely. Well, let's start with the themes next. The first theme is about how one bonds with nature. Innisfree is symbolic as a place that is filled with calmness and tranquility. It is here where the poet wants to live in solitude, to eat the vegetables he grows, to take the honey that has been produced by the honeybees. It is here that he knows that he can be closest to nature without disturbance of the city life. Now for the second theme, which is inner peace. Because of that solitude, and that calmness and that tranquility, the poet embraces inner peace 
like he has never felt it before. It is such a soothing environment that this peace which is within him is like his own companion. Nowhere else would he have enjoyed this calmness and this solitude and this tranquility and therefore the Lake Isle of Innisfree is certainly the place to be when man wants to be free of the stress of modern day life. Well, that's all we have now from the literature room. See you soon. Bye! Well, was that helpful? Do you understand what William Butler Yeats was trying to get across through that poem? Yeah! Oh, that's good. Well, boys, I have to go now. See you in a bit then. Bye! Bye, Bye Susie! Susie. You know what, Isa? I think I want to find my own industry. You know, a place where I can really be in tune with nature. A quiet place, far, far away from the crowds of people and the concrete buildings and the noisy vehicles, away from all that pollution and the stress of modern living. Isaac? Isaac? Where are you? Isaac? Isaac! But that was my last go. Ah, I'm in luck. I'll open the tap and fill up my canister. No, don't. It's not safe to drink water from a tap unless it's been boiled or filtered. But I'm thirsty. I know, uh, there's a shop across the road. I'll just go over and buy a bottle of water. Yes, that's a good idea. I think I'll get one too. Tasha, they just want teensy wincy problem. What's that, Nawa? I'm out of money. Can you borrow me two ringgit, please? Sure, no problem. Thanks, I'll return back as soon as we get home. Okay, here's the two ringgit. Now let's go and get the water before you collapse or something. <laughs> me collapse? You've got to be joking. I'm as strong as an ox. Oh. Mistakes, mistakes. My snoop report tells me that Nawal made three mistakes. Let's see what they are. Here's the first one. Ah! I'm in luck. I'll open the tap and fill up my canister. Oh dear. Nawal was going to open the tap. <laughs> Gosh, she'd need a spanner and a screwdriver to do that. <laughs> that was not what she meant. You see, you do not open a tap when you want to make the water supply flow from it. You turn it on. So this is how Nawal should have said it. Ah, I'm in luck. I'll turn on the tap and fill out my canister. Similarly, we don't close the tap when we're done with it. We turn it off. And remember that this same rule applies to other things. For example, we turn on and turn off a television set, not open and close it. We turn on and turn off a light, not open and close it. Okay? Let's move on to now our second mistake. I'm out of money. Can you borrow me two ringgit, please? Sure, no problem. Hmm, now I was confused with the words borrow and lend. You see, when you want to borrow something that belongs to someone and return it to them later, you can either use the word borrow or lend. But you must remember to use it with the correct pronoun. Let's say you want to borrow your friend's bicycle. So, you could either say, Can I borrow your bicycle, please? Or, you could say, Can you lend me your bicycle, please? So remember that in cases like this, you must use the pronoun I 
with the word borrow and the pronoun me with the word lend. Okay? Here's what Nawal should have said. Uh, I want a money too. Could you lend me two ringgit please? Sure, no problem. And here's the last mistake. Thanks, I'll return back the money as soon as we get home. Hmm, return back. That doesn't sound right, does it? Well, when we borrow something, we have to give it back to the owner, right? In other words, we return it. So, to return something means to give it back. So, we should not use those two words together because the word back is redundant or unnecessary. Let's see how Nawal should have said it. Thanks, I'll return the money as soon as we get home. Well, that's enough of mistakes for a day. See you in a bit. Hi there. It's been a long day. Do you want to know what I did a while ago? Well, I spoke to some boys and girls around here. I gave them some cartoons and asked them some questions. What I wanted was for them to tell me the meaning that was closest to the phrase or expression in those cartoons. And here's what happened. I showed Ryan this picture and I asked him this question. Which of the following is the closest in meaning to all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy? And here's Ryan's answer. Well, Jack can be anybody, even me. I think it means that too much of anything is not good. We must have some kind of balance in whatever we do. So, looking at the very tired and burned out boy who spends all his time studying, I would have to say that A is the answer. It's not good to work too hard. We have to relax too. Am I right, Susie? Absolutely correct, Ryan. Well done. Then I showed Tasha this. And this is what Tasha's question was. Is A or B closest in meaning to feeling under the weather? Well, let me see. The cartoon is that of a girl who looks really, really miserable. She looks like she's got the flu or something. Maybe the weather made her fall ill. Maybe she got wet in the rain or something. So I would choose B. I really feel ill today as the answer. That's the closest in meaning to feeling under the weather. It's definitely not A because she's not referring to the weather outside. How did I do, Susie? That's right, Tasha. The answer is B. Feeling under the weather is another way of saying that you're not feeling well. Next, I flashed this cartoon and got Ibrahim to answer my question. Ibrahim, which phrase is closest in meaning to over the moon? A. Very tired. B. Extremely happy. Or C. Terribly disappointed. Hmm. Over the moon. It has to be B, Susie. Extremely happy. I mean, the guy in the picture, he's holding a trophy and smiling from ear to ear. He's happy as happy can be. There's no way that he could be tired or disappointed, so the answer cannot be A or C. The phrase that is closest to the meaning over the moon is B, extremely happy. Very good, my friend. I'm over the moon with your answer. Well done, Ibrahim. Nazmi had this answer for the picture I showed him. Nazmi, is A or B the correct meaning for passed with flying colors. A. He passed his examination. B. He did extremely well in his examination. Flying colors. Well, it means that the boy did very well in his examination. So the answer must be B. He did extremely well in his examination. Okay, Susie? On the dot. Well done, Nazmi. Smart kids, aren't they? Well, my friends, it's time to go. I hope you had fun learning English with me, Susie Snoo. Don't forget to tune in to the next episode of Snips and Snaps. Bye.